Oh, that's true. That's true. We had a we had a, I, we, we had we had technical difficulties last week. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, sorry about that. Yeah, well, <laughs> when, when, when also, there was a guy yeah. with an Infinity truck right out. Yeah, yeah I, here, funny. Right? I so. I told Lauren that too as it was happening. I was like, of course I'm stuck across the street. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> anyway, um, well, let me recap. And since uh, we're delighted to have Sophie here, it, you weren't here last week, were you? No, okay, it's first time. Or um, we. Had, we were in the Gospel of Matthew, and um, the cha first chapter was a genealogy, um, but a really, really interesting one because it's Matthew's um, uh, agenda, and I mean it in the kindest way possible, um, to kind of make a connection between Jesus and um, Abraham, and also in that bloodline, the David, the king of um Israel, that's kind of their Messiah-like figure, um, who we all spent a lot of time with in First and Second Samuel. Um, and then it gets right into the birth narrative, and that this is all a departure from the only previously known gospel at this time would have been Mark. Um, but it's not clear as into what wide circulation Mark was at the time of Matthew, but we know for a fact. Well, we know because we've ruled out all the other possibilities. We know, scholars know, that uh, Matthew had Mark's gospel at his disposal and sometimes lifted pieces of it and rewrote them or rearranged things, too. So, which we would call plagiarism today, but back then they considered it a great honor. So, there you go. And that got us into the second half of chapter one where we heard the birth narrative of Jesus. And you all probably talked about that um, poor Mary is relegated to the background and it's all Joseph's point of view. So you already see one of the, the criticisms, um, some might say flaws in this narrative, which is it's very patronizing and mm -hmm. paternalistic. Mm -hmm. um, or is it, you know, we'll see if that's true. But since that's the first chapter, that's all we have to go on. <laughs> And then you got to the start of the second chapter, which is the wonderful story of the Magi, where the three wise kings, wise in quotation mark, and um, they have this kind of fulfillment of a prophecy too, and they follow the star. And this is the story we hear on Epiphany, um, because only Matthew records the story this way. So there you go, the Feast of the Epiphany. Well, I have to say that yes. my understanding is, is I know that we used to, as when we were kids, used to think of the three Magi as kings. But mm -hmm. from what I understand, Magi in the Middle Eastern means scientist or, or like the stars. word magic. Yeah. Kind of astrologers. Astrologers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so mystics that, almost. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, but men of great wealth. And, right. And, you know. Yeah, I think it's better to call them the Magi than the Kings. Um, Can I ask a question while we're talking oh, about sure. this, this again? You know, because we've been talking a lot about the the historicity of things, whether things are literally true historically and all that. Oh, sure. Is there are there any other sources, historical sources, that record a big celestial event? Um, that record a big celestial event? I don't know. I suspect there are, mm -hmm. or there were, there are definitely other sources, non non biblical of the time, and the main, the big one you always hear about is Josephus, Josephus right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, kind of around this time is when, well, soon after is when you start to get other writers more in the second century, but mm -hmm. men that might have been alive around this exact time period not the time period of jesus but about matthew's time period mm -hmm. and that would be people like origin and polycarp maybe mm -hmm. and um uh, and then maybe ignatius yeah mm -hmm. origin o-r-i-g-e-n -E yeah it's not same spelling yeah not not okay. i am yeah i think there is some, i think there's some astronomical evidence uh that there was a conjunction between <laughs> venus and mars and uh I forget the other, but there seems to be some some 
reason to believe that there was an exceptional conjunction around about that time. So, hmm. okay. yeah, so yeah. City. yeah I not think. like a Halley's Comet per se, but something mm -hmm. something that they could have easily mistaken for planets, as as we all, I mean, mistake for yeah. stars, as we all do, and then we have to remind ourselves we might be looking at a planet, mm -hmm. especially Venus. I think we see in our sky. Uh, I was rereading my notes. Can you? Can you explain what the Q source was? I, oh, I'd I love to. <laughs> I love, I love to. I think this is so fascinating, but I know it's sometimes hard to explain. Um, I wonder if I should draw it on the board. Yeah, yes. let me draw it on the board. Sorry. Can I draw on the, but I, can I, erase I, the I, you? Well, you know, Sophie didn't hear it, so. Oh, <laughs> so maybe let you all talk. Let you all talk about the dinner table here. Probably not. Is there a spreader? Oh, you need sure. a paper towel. <laughs> To the so, uh, yeah, yeah. Say the same. What we're yeah. talking about is something called the synoptic problem. Um, and the word synoptic means to look at with the same eye. And it's nothing more difficult than saying that in by the eight, mid 1800s, this kind of post enlightenment age where everybody's um, goo goo for science, who's looking are. In a good, in a very good and healthy way, but you know, once you're, once you're enamored with science and you're like Thomas Jefferson and all these guys, then you start looking at things that you believe and doubting them and questioning them, and then, which is also not a bad thing, but then you start applying scientific things to writings of faith, and it's really difficult. Um, didn't mean to start rambling. <laughs> so um, in all of that, in that in that kind of climate, that's where um, Benjamin, not Benjamin Bacon, I'm blanking on who it was, um, a, a number of people, but it was, they noticed a similarity between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh -huh. and they called it a synoptic problem, and so that's like sin, like synonym, so the same, and then optic, like eye, so the same eye, so looking at those three books with the same eye, they noticed that um, there were similarities and some discrepancies. And once they studied it, I mean, we're talking like decades, finally, um, probably really solidified, I think in the early 20th century, you come up with this idea, theory, which is pretty much proven. And again, like I was saying, you prove it by ruling out all the other possibilities mm -hmm. that you have the gospel of Mark, mm -hmm which was written in probably, I'm just going to put one date on it, the very latest date, 70 AD. Okay. All right. Then you've got uh, Matthew, which its latest date was probably 80 AD or CE. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Luke, which its latest date was probably 90 AD. And for the discussion of the synoptic problem, John is not a factor because John is so wacky, completely different. John's not using any of these gospels. Okay, so Mark is its own source, but they they found out that Matthew used Mark, and they also found out that Luke used Mark. But that's not all, because while Matthew and Luke did not write from each other, they did have other sources, and because there's other things in their book, so. All the things that are unique to Matthew, we'll just call it M for Matthew. Okay. Okay. And then all the things, let me just put, we got Mark, and then we got Mark goes here too. So, so far we got Matthew's making up things from Mark and from a source called M. That could be Matthew's own experience, that could be experience of the disciple named Matthew, who was kind of like a grandfather figure in the community, someone they all kind of looked up to, um, who would have said, I know Jesus, I knew him. Um, it could be somebody totally different. That's probably the best guess. Um, and a, just a community of people with Matthew being the person either chosen or volunteered themselves to write the gospel down. Then there's a source. Okay, so similarly, Luke has a source of some stories that are only found in Luke. So that we call those L. But Matthew and Luke both have, and I changed it, I think it's wrong. Let me put Luke over here because Matthew and Luke have 
similarities in a source that is different from Mark. So in other words, there is some stuff that Matthew and Luke both have that Luke does not, and they're identical. Therefore, there's a third source, and they call that source Q. And Q is short for, well, what you think is French, but it's actually German, and means unknown. I think it means unknown. Thank you. Yeah, so that's one way to look at it. There's all kinds of ways to map it out, but if you think of each of these Gospels, I mean, what, what we're really talking about is say Matthew probably had lots and lots of sources, mm -hmm. but they're all lost to history. So we just kind of call all those sources M. Mm -hmm. And then everything that's in agreement with Luke, word for word, or even, you know, they could tell that they somebody just lifted a sentence and kind of moved it in a different order. That's called Q. You actually have a book, I have a book, that is just the Q saying, it's the first word mm -hmm. Oh. So um, it it doesn't read as a as a story because it's it's just fragment. Um, but that also means Q is lost to history. Whoever whatever Matthew used is lost to history. Whatever Luke used is lost to history. Whatever we're reading of Matthew, Mark, and Luke is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Mm -hmm. And I think that number of copies they estimate it being forty six. So. In a game of telephone, there's a lot of things that can get lost in translation on a 46 copy. Mm -hmm. Just like you would take a photocopy and run it through 46 times through, it gets degeneratively worked, right? So you get little things through the years like in innocent mistakes, but mistakes like copyist misreads a letter and if you're talking about Greek or Hebrew, when you do that, it makes the word completely different, right? Yeah. Or they see, or there's a tear in, you know, this is not digital, so there's a problem in the paper, and they can't, they have to make up what the word is, the missing part, like in Jurassic Park, where they have oh, to finish yes. up the DNA, yeah. the dinosaur, right? And they put a frog DNA in. It's the same thing. How do they get it's not how that works, exactly. I was going to say, it's like in Superman 3. <laughs> where they're trying to make kryptonite and there's a source they don't know so they put tar in and then that is, doesn't kill Superman it turns him evil oh, no. which there's 30 minutes in that movie that is sensational and then it's surrounded by a whole bunch of junk so, have you been anyway. down to see Superman yet? no I have funny I was just watching a uh, oh no I've been there I've been there yeah been there. it was kind of dead um, and the reason I'm Heartbound Superman is because I love it, but also because I'm workshopping that this will be our evening class in the fall is like superheroes oh, and oh, fate oh, and stuff. So with a heavy lean on Superman because that's got the most <laughs> priced imagery in it. Yeah. So there you go. That me too. Yeah. But you know, some of these other Marvel movies have something to say about superheroes. Yes, Leslie. Yeah. Just so you know, in the back of my NRSV Bible, there's a list. They have a list of the parallel texts from the the three that are equal in the three gospels and then they have some of them oh, that are some of the q that some of the q um sources that matthew and luke had some of the um references and they they had those and there's there's a number of those that are the same they didn't list any of the ones that are um just they just list the parallel text they don't list any that are just their own, like Matthew right. has his own or, or Luke has his own stuff. Exactly. But I just thought that was interesting because I was, I always go back to my uh, back of my Bible because there's all sorts of stuff back there yeah. that gives you ideas of things to, to look at. And that one thing you're describing, I have a book that's basically like one big chart called Gospel Parallels that lays them out, the three of them side by side. Yeah, um, it doesn't have what she has. No. And it's interesting. I you just, just kind of it. see, you see that there was, you see that it was deliberative. It's not it's just an accident. Years. You see that they literally were thinking and making changes. And, um, well, anyway, there's that. So it's it's really the, interesting. The, yes. the Q, I would just say the Q source is uh, primarily sayings of Jesus. Yeah. And it's interesting that the Q source, although it's, sometimes virtually verbatim it's not always used in the same context in matthew and luke so that's that good. yeah anyway so that's just an yeah 
yeah, I, like I don't know this one for a fact, but I would say maybe Jesus's healing of a the blind man where he rubs the dirt in his eye. You know, let me just name that as a possible example. I don't know for sure. But, you know, that could be occurring in one section of Mark where he's in Galilee and it's early in his ministry. And then Matthew might use it late in the ministry as a scene at, in Jerusalem. That's one of the scenes that causes the Pharisees to get upset. And you see how the, yeah. it doesn't take Jesus away from the healing, but it, it changes the, mm -hmm. the tenor of the context a little bit. Yeah. I believe it's only in Mark that he uses the mud, you know, that, 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 yeah, exactly. that and, then that's just, kind of a, and then he says something called ifatha, which is kind of a magical word. So it's more, a more primitive account that gives a more, an more, uh, old Testament prophet kind of, uh, right. uh slant on things than the uh, Matthew and Luke accounts do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And of course, the other one, since we're, you know, it's still in our, we can still see it in our rearview mirror is, you know, Palm Sunday and Good Friday. Um, the three, all four accounts are different of the death and resurrection of Jesus. But, um, you know, it's particularly Jesus's words on the cross, which we sometimes conflate into one long thing, which is not, not usually the best thing to do. That's seven last words of Jesus, because they're because their accounts have different things they're emphasizing. So, for example, in Mark's death account, Jesus only says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think in in Matthew, it's almost just that. And then he also says it is accomplished or it is finished. John, he says it is finished and says I thirst and then has the conversation with Mary and John. Hmm. Behold your mother. And then Luke has the whole dialogue with the... Um, the repentant thief right so you see and they all kind of show you know the truth is still there jesus died on the cross <laughs> mm -hmm. and was either either in emotional as well as physical pain feeling isolated or lost from god which is human and relatable or he was in an act of of forgiving others to the very end mm -hmm. you know and they're none of those are not true of jesus it's just a a different kind of approach mm -hmm. to the to the passion so there you go. If we go back to the star, yeah, I footnote that I oh, great. To yeah. share. It just it's this footnote is trying to put the wise men's visit and their language mm. specifically in a very political context, which I thought was interesting. When they call him king, this child who's born king of the Jews, it says king's a title that could only have been granted by Rome. And so it gives us the footnote author thinks the story is getting potentially subversive political implications wow. and then when they say the star they point out that there was a famous leader of an israelite messianic messianic rebellion like who was called son of the star oh wow so there's just some like tones there the footnotes yeah so kind of pulling in some other sources and that it's like calling him king it's <clears throat> referencing a star that's great so in a former Bible study class years ago mm -hmm. that I was in, and the, the priest that was conducting it was kind of a Markan scholar. Uh -huh. According to him, a lot of Mark's gospel is very political, and that a lot of the stories in there have all of these hidden meanings. Mm -hmm. um, so if that part was borrowed from Mark and put in Matthew also, that whole political undertone thing that, mm -hmm. that would be part of an explanation for that. I don't know. Yeah. I just, I'd never, I just read it as it, mm -hmm. as the words. Mm -hmm. But then if you start thinking like king as a title exactly. would be very subversive. You can, certainly, you can certainly understand why Herod reacted the way he did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find later on that a lot of the terms they use for Jesus are terms that they specifically use for Caesar, uh, king, lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those things there they and so the fact that they were they were political in a sense that jesus was establishing a new kind of kingdom and uh, that was that was a threat to rome and it was a that, yeah so and to keep that in mind i think that's a good point that uh that you all are making yeah good. yep i'm just scanning some other notes see if i'm missing anything on the star um yeah nothing nothing significant just uh, this is Raymond Brown, who's uh, did a big 
opus book on the New Testament, and he says the Magi story contributes to the parallels to Moses, which we talked about two mm -hmm. weeks ago, you know, that um, G uh, Matthew is trying to make a big comparison of Jesus to Moses. Obviously, he's a lot stronger, more powerful, whatever you want to say, than more important than Moses. But um, but because that's the story everyone in Israel has grown up with, that's why he's making that connection. Okay, you know Moses. Everyone knows Moses backwards and forwards. Well, this, this Jesus is like Moses in many ways. So the and the idea here is the Magi contribute to the Moses parallelism. For in Jewish legends of Jesus's time, the Pharaoh received information from wise men. <laughs> later, later, when Moses was leading Israel through the Transjordan, the wicked king Balak summoned Balaam, whom Philo, who's another first century writer, mm -hmm. he called Magos, M-A-G-O-S, mm -hmm. similar to Magi, mm -hmm. which is, obviously we know is where the word magic comes from. Mm -hmm. right? But again, they're also wealthy because then, according to Matthew, they show up with gold. That's, I mean, you don't just, didn't just pick it up at the 7-Eleven on the way. <laughs> Frankincense and myrrh, so um, <laughs> there you go. And a lot of dreams talk. Already in two passages, you got Joseph's dream. You know, so the, the idea of the dream is giving you kind of some guidance here is a big, big deal too, part of that magic as well. So I'm curious, I want to, how do they reconcile that the Jews thought that magic and portents and things were bad, were evil? How did they, how did they differentiate between what they said the the other people that, that worshipped false gods right. was magic and what they were seeing with Jesus and mm -hmm. other people dreaming and stuff was not the same. Yeah. It was not magic, was not was not portents and omens and something that was evil. How did they reconcile that? Because well, honestly it didn't seem like it was all that different. Well it's, it's a good question and I'm I'm sure David's got points to make I, my guess is um that the, you what you're seeing what you're reading is matthew trying to work some of that out you mm -hmm. know with he is going off on a tangent from judaism to include some of this magic and and but it's you know it's not like which is magic and it's not like black magic right but there it's that god the god of jesus yahweh has control over those supernatural universe, elements too yeah, yes because he is the god mm -hmm. and everyone else's gods are <clears throat> puny gods right yeah the so use of dreams i was yeah. just going to say the use of dreams and uh, you know it, it goes way back to the old testament there were a lot of dreams joseph interpreted the dreams of pharaoh and so forth and so god came to people in wow. dreams this was this wasn't this wasn't the same thing as the kind of witchcraft that uh was condemned in the old testament which a lot of times had to do with trying to contact dead spirits and things like that so there, there was a distinction we talked about that a little bit last week too about how 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 often dreams were used by here and and earlier by the jews to foretell the future or or you know get get instructions from god we talk and also the you know in the culture of course these kind of portents and auguries were were pretty important too the uh, jews had a uh, a pair of stones that the priests used umum and thumum i think they were called and if they were going to want to ask at it got a uh, a question of some type they would cast them and see which you know what what god what god answer would be so there's there's more there than we realize sometimes carol the only certain wow. things are or predict you know and it this of course arises out of the out of the culture because the romans you know they believed in dreams they believed in auguries they believed in sacrificing animals and reading the entrails you know before they went into battle and things like that this was very much a part of the culture yeah. well and also the casting of dice uh or casting lots you know that happens a lot in the new testament and that's you're kind of giving it up to the fates you know to make the decision for you mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. good stuff okay we read? Well, let's read the Bible. Um, I'm going to read from the Women's uh, CEB Bible. So it's the CEB translation. Um, interestingly enough, the editors have nothing to say about women because they are marginalized thus far in this book. So we'll get there. 
This is in <clears throat> Egypt, this chapter 2, verse 13. When the Magi had departed, an angel from the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Here we go again. Mm -hmm. And said, get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod will soon search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up and during the night took the child and his mother to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I have called my son out of Egypt. When Herod knew the Magi had fooled him, he grew very angry. He sent soldiers to kill all the children in Bethlehem and in the surrounding territory who were two years old and younger, according to the time that he heard he had learned from the Magi. This fulfilled the words spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and much grieving, Rachel weeping for her children, and she did not want to be comforted because they were no more. After King Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said, <laughs> and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. Those who were trying to kill the child are now dead. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus ruled over Judea in place of his father Herod, Joseph was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he went to the area of Galilee. He settled in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Okay. Okay. Question last week, I still want to know what you think. Yeah. Why didn't John the Baptist get killed? He was only six months older than Jesus. Uh, great question. I don't know. No one's ever asked that. I'm sure, he, sure someone's uh, asked that. Well, maybe he was too far away. Okay. According to what I looked up, Elizabeth and Zechariah lived in Ain, Ain Karam, which is 100 miles south of Nazareth. So they were out of the radius of the slaughter. Oh, Got okay. it. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, there you go. There's your answer. I guess. Well, I don't know how far Herod's rule went. So. Right. Well, my like my subheading calls it murder of the Bethlehem children. So Bethlehem. Okay. it may have just been the city limits. Okay. Um, yeah, or and, suburbs. And do is this like to use your word historicity? Yeah, or is this um, just establishing another Moses parallel? Exactly, yeah. That right. is almost the question. That's my isn't question. it? Like what is what is real and what isn't real? Because it sounds to me, I read it a little defensive from Matthew or pre-defensive who's trying to fit some of these things in, some of these traditions in. So the def the for me that reads defensive is every time he quotes scripture, right? Which is a lot. So hopefully in your Bibles, some of this stuff is offset or put in italics or something yes. like verse 15, I have called my son out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Verse 18 is a quote from Jeremiah. And I'm just looking at a footnote. That's from Jeremiah 31. And you just kind of wonder again, is that, did Matthew want to tell this story because he was a, you know, he was thinking about Jeremiah 31, 15 and said, oh, this, this is a good opportunity here. Or was he taking from a historical record of some sort and, and put it in? The whole thing is curious because it's only in Matthew. This is what we'd call an M source. Okay. Yeah, his, uh, his concern about drawing parallels between Jesus and uh, Abraham and Moses, and the uh, I think it's it speaks to the fact that he's trying to he's trying to to write to a a group of people that have Jewish background, and they're he's trying to equate former leaders and kings with Jesus, and trying to make that parallel, which would be persuasive. The people who are familiar with the Old Testament. Exactly. So by getting the the Holy Family out into Egypt, it's almost like he's writing an HBO show and he's kind of going to back into it and go, okay, well, let's create some drama and some, some intrigue here. But really his point is to say, just like Moses was put in the basket by the women and sent down the River Nile, so was Jesus symbolically taken and physically taken to Egypt as well. Yeah. It's almost like there's a conversation happening where he's exactly. trying to say Jesus is the Messiah, and someone saying, "No, no, no. Scripture says out of Egypt the Messiah." 
Right. It's like, all right, well, <laughs> what if? <laughs> well, as you know, Jesus went to Egypt, right? And people are like, really? <laughs> well, yes. Um, yeah, there's a, it's a clear, it's almost a, it's not only does he have Matthew, I mean, he's Matthew, he's got Mark, mm -hmm. and now he's also got a scroll of, because he's probably wealthy, he's got a scroll of Exodus, and he's kind of looking at all these things, so he's, you see how it's like, it's like ingredients on a pizza, kind of, <laughs> I'm hungry, <laughs> <laughs> and, and naming all of these names like Archelaus and Herod and, and timing it around the deaths and all is all there to kind of try to give it some authenticity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and put it in history. Yeah. I there's a, there's a, oh, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Geography question. Go no. for it. In, in this last passage we were reading it refers to herod being the king of judea but it also refers to israel yeah mm -hmm. and then the region of galilee so yeah did, did Your question. Israel refer to the entire the entire area where all of the kingdoms existed no it's it's at this time and now we do call it all right ancient israel israel yes it's world. but it is two different um Two different oh. uh, tribes, uh -huh. uh, two of the remnant tribes of of Joseph, uh -huh. Isaac. Yeah. yeah, Isaac, Joseph, Jacob. That's Jacob. it. Thank you. Um, everything that I'm, I'm pointing on this map here, and I'll I'll show it to the camera in a second. Everything to the north of my finger, which uh -huh. is kind of a, a orangish color, uh -huh. is the kingdom of Israel at the time, and then everything that's purple below is the kingdom of Judah or Judea. Okay, and they are right. Uh, Jerusalem and Bethlehem are within Judah. Okay, yeah. Israel contains the Sea of Galilee and oh. Nazareth and all. So, Joseph, geographically, it's great you asked this. Joseph is, you got to get through Judea to get to a place where um, Herod's not doesn't have any rain. So that's how they end up getting to Nazareth. So in this story uh -huh. but they remember they were in egypt so they got to go all the way through judea to get to israel you get the same map right yeah, yeah. That, that's why i'm helping so that's basically it because it went it's it's kind of jockeying between the two regions because they're right next to each other like it's also their namesakes of two of the 12 tribes correct right so what happened to the other ten? Why does any of the other ten the tribes have the region Judea. named after yeah, them? Well, well yeah, yeah. Here's or, or, you know, there's people that are from them, but they this basically kind of got absorbed over right. centuries. Yeah, and also, also in four BCE, um, Herod the Great died, and uh, after he died, his kingdom was separated into three uh, different kingdoms. It was called the Tetrarch. And there was Herod Archelaus, as you talked about, Herod Antipas. And then there was a second, uh, there was a third. Yeah. So. Son. His son. Yeah. He's so, got multiple sons. So, wasn't that Herod Antipas? No, that was a different Herod, okay. I think. Yeah. So there's Herod, another Herod, too, Philippus. They split the kingdom for his three sons. They yeah. got yeah. a piece of it? Yeah, exactly. So the one who is the Herod when John the Baptist is of age, and the one the Herod he's fighting with is Antipas. Antipas. Herod Antipas, right? Well, didn't his oldest son he killed him, right? So the three left, the three sons that were left were like fighting over what? Sounds like it. Yeah. Herod, modern day succession. Not, not a was, modern, ancient day succession. His son was was uh, gonna kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, I mean, Herod uh, the father, Herod the Great. Clearly, is a paranoid. Is Herod a title and not his real name? No, that's the name. Antipon? It's just it's like a last name, right? You know. Oh, oh, oh. oh okay. Um, but you know his paranoia here and his fear of the Judean, uh, not Judean, the Israeli, no, not the Israeli, the Jude. I'm trying to make Judaism as a noun. I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. The Jewish Messiah you know, coming from scripture prophecy to overtake him is a threat to his power. So he's paranoid in this story. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you have to remember also that that was a really delicate balance, was it not, in terms of, you know, Rome allowed Herod to exist. Right. Mm -hmm. And Rome yep. was using Herod to kind of keep things all together. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure that as a ruler, if he saw that house of cards falling, it, it could have been massive bloodshed. It could have <laughs> been, you know, the Romans, okay, you had your chance. Now right. we're really going to oppress you exactly that kind of thing the depiction in that the miniseries that i show yeah. off of egypt and nazareth mm -hmm. the one from 40 50 years ago the pilot punches pilot is played by rod steger and oh. the the acting choices which are probably director choices have him being showing up very annoyed mm -hmm. uh irritated because you know he's i don't know what he does day to day but it's probably sitting around with people serving him and you know mm -hmm. who knows what and here he has been dispatched to come to be there to to sort out this Jesus drama. <laughs> so it, you get the idea of a tension between the Ro the Romans and the Jewish leaders, and and it's like you guys are supposed to not like if stuff boils up to Rome and Rome has to deal with it, they're really upset and angry. Okay. So yeah. there was that kind of gets portrayed there too. You know, right. they won't they don't want they they want the property, they don't want the drama. They that don't want sense. rioting in the streets so, either, no, or yeah, you know, exactly. mass mayhem. Yeah. Normally, politicians don't want that. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but as we've seen, <laughs> as we've seen, some some do want it and don't know what they're asking for. Right. All right. Uh, chapter three. Would anyone like to read? Um, let's see. Oh, it's a very short chapter. You can do the whole thing. Anyone? I can do a message. Okay, great. And the title for mine, Matthew, is Thunder in the Desert. Ooh. While Jesus was living in the Galilean hills, John, called the baptizer, was preaching in the desert country of Judea. His message was simple and austere, like his desert, desert surroundings. Change your life. God's kingdom is here. John and his message were authorized by Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy. Thunder in the desert, prepare for God's arrival, make the road smooth and straight. John dressed in a camel hair habit tied at the waist by a leather strap. He lived on a diet, diet of locusts and wild field honey. People poured out of Jerusalem, Judea, and the Jordanian countryside to hear and see him in action. There at the Jordan River, those who came to confess their sins were baptized into a changed life. When John realized that a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees were showing up for a baptismal experience because it was becoming the popular thing to do, he exploded. Brood of snakes, what do you think you're doing slithering down here to the river? Do you think a little water on your snake's skin is going to make any difference? It's your life that must change, not your skin. And don't think you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father. Being a descendant of Abraham is neither here nor there. Descendants of Abraham are a dime a dozen. <laughs> what, counts, <laughs> what counts is your life? Is it green and blossoming? Because if it's dead wood, it goes on the fire. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. The real action comes next. The main character in this drama, compared to him, I'm a mere stagehand, will ignite the kingdom life within you, a fire within you, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of your lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. Everything false he'll put out with the trash to be burned. Jesus then appeared, arriving at the Jordan River from Galilee. He wanted John to baptize him. John objected, I'm the one who needs to baptize, not to be baptized, not you. But Jesus insisted, do it. God's work, putting things right all these centuries, is coming together right now in this baptism. So John did it. The moment Jesus came up out of the baptismal waters, the skies opened up and he saw God's spirit. It looked like a dove descending and landing on him and alone with the spirit, a voice. 
This is my son, chosen and marked by my love, the light of my life. Ooh. Oh, I love oh, that version. Oh, yeah, yeah. love it's totally it. different from what it is. So you, you see the beauty the in Eugene Peterson's translation for the message, you know, what he's trying to trying to get us away from the words that we hear and we kind of know, but they kind of just kind of make you go, huh? Like, this is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. This is what Jesus perfectly said during the baptism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, John is like, the, the only in this account also, does John give all of that um, the preaching, he's a preacher after my own heart, it's one of metaphor, he's used about three different metaphors, and then Jesus shows up and John says, I should be baptized by you, you know, so he knows who Jesus is when he shows up. I mean, they're cousins, but it's not like cousins here where, you know, you see each other Easter Sunday, and well, there was no Easter Sunday then, uh, you know, we see each other every, you know, six weeks or so, yeah, this is like maybe a couple, you know, maybe a decade or so you, you see your cousin, um and and he's say, basically saying i know i know you're the one i know who it is and i should be baptized by you and jesus says nope i need to be baptized so so does, you're the baptizer does john the baptist was there a like how did he find out that jesus is the one yeah was there a like a, it's a another one it's basically a rhetorical name. question well she knows in another gospel not in this gospel. Yeah. That's only in Luke. I was watching this over the weekend on the History Channel. They were having like these history of the Bible, and mm -hmm. according to these people, now I don't know who developed produced these shows, but that Jesus and John the Baptist probably did know each other as they children. Know. They probably did get together, and they knew they were cousins. But the, I, I found it interesting that they they uh, they said that Jesus, I mean Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. Which, because Elizabeth descended from the the Levi tribe, so oh. that gives Jesus his right to be a rabbi. Oh, interesting. That's probably true. Yeah. In the well, Cynthia Bourgeau book that I like, yeah. Wisdom Jesus, that some of us read, some of us enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> um, a subset of those of us who read it, but um, she has a whole chapter where she says Jesus is a recognition event. That there's something about Jesus, and you see it over and over again, where John, for whatever reason, when he sees his cousin in that moment, he's like, it's you. Yeah. Or Mary thinking it's the gardener, but all of a sudden she's like, oh, it's you. Mm -hmm. For people mending their fishing net saw, it's mm -hmm. you. That there's something, she calls it, Jesus is a recognition event. Right. And I think that's just a really beautiful yeah, yeah. image. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what's happening right here. So somehow John is like. It's great. Absolutely. And it is. There's something here. And we're left to speculate. So yeah. kind of what you're saying, Barb, was like, a, really, it's a rhetorical question because mm -hmm. there's no text that tells that's us right. what John, how John knew it was Jesus or not, just that he knows. And there's it's something, something in his yeah. presence. I'm reading right now. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that, go ahead. I'm reading a book called This Much We Can Believe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a real interesting, it's kind of a progressive take on all that. But, it, but this guy really delves in, and, and he's talking about how the Gospels are, are inconsistent about when Jesus took on the mantle of divinity. Right. Because according to some passages, he was God from the beginning of everything. And and there are some biblical scholars that, that say, no, Jesus became the son of God at the baptism. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then there are other biblical scholars that debunk both of those things. Right. So, but, you know, if, if Jesus were, in fact, divine from the beginning of time, there's absolutely no need to be baptized. When you think about what baptism is all about. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you take away the sins of someone who's sinless? Yeah. You know, you know, God doesn't need baptism. We need baptism, right? If you know, mm -hmm. according to what baptism is supposed to be. So anyway, it's just uh, sure. again talk about parallels and differences that the Gospels portray that whole issue, right? Very differently. And it's you know, it's for for. Um, that is all absolutely true because there's just like you know there's no agreement really mm -hmm. just like this the the a whole act of studying the bible there's not much agreement there's possibilities 
And here too, with this baptism, you know, the, the, the first lens to always look, turn, you know, imagine you've got like five different glasses on. Mm -hmm. The first one you want to put on is what is Matthew's point in connection to the old Testament? That's the first one to look at, you know, mm -hmm. so there, for him, it is a, it's an anointing, you know, this is a, mm -hmm. this is a cosmic thing, which is what I talked about on Sunday because the dove shows up, you know, the, uh, a voice from heaven speaks, you know, these are not normal occurrences mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and, and yet all that's really happening is he's just got John just dunking him underwater a little bit so that that is also part of like a rite of passage or like a, a ritual, human ritual. Mm -hmm. Think about the ones that, you know, if you were a storyteller that you could have done because everyone is always frustrated that there's no stories about Jesus as a child because we just skipped 30 years. Right. Mm -hmm. So what would be, if you're a Jewish child, what would be the most important rite of passage? The bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would have been a good story or a time to tell us if you're a storyteller and say, well, maybe young Jesus started to know who he was then. But again, we don't know because it's not there. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. It's so I think it's there's no bar mitzvah. Isn't that interesting? I've never thought about that before. Yeah. How old are they when they get bar mitzvah though? 12, 13? 13? 13? Well, yeah. 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 He, he was, was in the temple. Yeah, yeah. They, oh, well, 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 when he was in the temple. Getting ready. Yeah. Yeah, but the yeah, Greg. Like yeah, Susan. What about the um the story of him his parents are looking for him and he's in the temple teaching? That's the one, yeah, that's what we're talking about. That's only in Luke um and that's it that's all that's <laughs> that's all i gotta say <laughs> it's only in luke's gospel so i don't know it's you know it's it's why matthew doesn't tell it why john doesn't tell it why mark doesn't tell it is a bit of a mystery but you can the, the best assumption is they just didn't think it was important for their story mm -hmm. otherwise they wouldn't said it do we know who the author of luke is uh no speculations speculation we'll call him luke probably we call him luke the physician um but he's also a great writer so luke was probably i don't know if he was actually a doctor but he was a very edu well educated gentleman we think if it was a man okay. and may have known paul because he's uh he also wrote acts yeah the just 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 in just as a note I, I i just checked i i was pretty sure i was right but the bar mitzvah that wasn't part of jesus time they didn't have bar mitzvah okay. then that stopped about that started around the sixth century but really wasn't practiced until like the middle ages oh interesting um, this is this is the diaspora judaism here it the bar mitzvah it's not actually uh They've had, they had to institute whole new practices after right. the temple was destroyed. destroyed. So, the, yeah. Um, the other thing I was interested in this passage was John could hardly have been more insulting to the, uh, the people coming out. He compared them to snakes, which were the ones that tempted, you know, Eve and Adam in the, in the garden. He, yeah. he, he said, he said that, their whole religion was based on the fact that they were sons of Abraham and therefore the chosen people of God. And John says, <laughs> God could make sons of Abraham. You know, he could make right. them out of sons. Is it any wonder, to, to Peterson. Right. <laughs> is it any wonder that he later got <laughs> his mouth got him in trouble a little later right. with uh, with the king? Yeah. So yeah. exactly. Yeah, he, exactly. Yeah. He was hitting them in the sore spots. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um don't know if it's no oh, never mind it's i don't think it's quite relevant there's a movie that kind of deals with the, the dynamics of a jesus and i'll mention it but i'm i'm foggy now on the memory i i remember a movie from about four years ago called judas and the black messiah hmm. which takes Please place it that. takes place in the late 60s early <laughs> 70s and mm -hmm. um the actor who lit who was the lead in get out some of you watched that uh -huh. uh, when we did it he was he won an Oscar for this movie, and it's a it basically the story of two, um, uh, for lack of a better word, rabble rousers in the Black Panther movement, and one of whom is kind of a John the Baptist figure preparing oh, their way. Yes, yeah, social activists, 
and um, and the other one is kind of the one he is preparing the way for, so to speak. And they kind of they push that metaphor a bit stronger. So that's an interesting movie to look at because it is a dynamic we see a lot. You know, there's often this idea of somebody is a prophet, and and yet they are quick to say, "I'm not the person you think I am, but I am here to kind of make make their way straight." You know, that's a that's a familiar storytelling theme and device too as part of it and and yet Dave is totally right Matthew dials up the the drama and the audacity of what John is saying um that it's becomes of course you know just by saying all that it's only a matter of time before he's going to be executed um but Jesus does not do what John does I think that's also kind of important you know John's followers kind of get absorbed by Jesus and so to speak but it's not that Jesus is replacing John in any way. It's just that John is part of this, you know, this rite of passage, um, this preparing um, Jesus well, for his own ministry. It said that before Jesus actually came out to his own ministry, he was considered a follower of John. Oh, okay, yeah. That's possibly true. Yeah, probably. Yeah, John Baptist was John in a higher role, you know. Right. That that definitely is one theory that they there were three large groups that that Jews could belong to three large sects. One was the Pharisees, the other was the Sadducees, the third was the Essenes, and part of the Essene movement was there's controversy over whether Jesus was more closely related to the Pharisees or the Essenes. But one of the one of the practices of the Essenes was you went out into the desert and you followed a prophet or a, you know a crazy prophet out in the desert and and you were under under his ministry for a while and then he accepted you and initiated you into the uh, into the cult or you know that not the cult but the sect so yeah this is it's there's some interesting background here going on as to, in terms of how Jesus relates um jesus although he wasn't quite like john the baptist he was pretty straight about the pharisees sometimes he called them a brood of vipers too and called them whitewashed graves and yeah so he was pretty straight to the pharisees as well it's not too surprising that he also ended up crucified because exactly. he was pretty straight, straight with the religious leaders of his day in the way that they were yeah, involved in self-righteousness and condemning other people and uh yeah. <laughs> sounds like today yeah <laughs> <Always>. <laughs> one thing with matthew or any part of the bible if this happened now how much is mental yeah. illness okay oh, or oh, I, sure i can um, see your aura yeah right mm -hmm. I, can, I can see your aura and that's my coming like understanding that jesus is right the white light that shines on you that's your aura if I hear angels, okay, if they're telling me what to do, how quick is a schizophrenia diagnosis? Right. You know, and we're talking around, you know, 20 to 30 years old is when we're looking at that diagnosis with what we know today. Right. Totally. Um, and I have the only one I've heard more now is Joan of Arc. Um, hmm. Religious scholars say, nope, that was schizophrenia. She is mm -hmm. the only one I've and not saying everybody believes that or doesn't. Mm -hmm. She is the only person I've ever heard somebody say. But when you yeah. look at the at the, the medical diagnosis of schizophrenia, what they're talking about is an altered mm -hmm. reality. So does that mean that you're really crazy or you're looking at things <laughs> differently <laughs> than people? You know, well, we you, call it crazy. And if you're hurting right. people or yourself, mm -hmm. that's right. where the medical. Right. right. If you just want to live in that world, if yeah. you're doing okay, if you're doing good work. What about the I think people leave you alone. <laughs> but I'm not like, but and I can't remember. It's actually I, I've always had issues with this story as a kid and then as parent. Um, who's he? What's it? What's his name? Has a dream. Mm -hmm. God tells him, "I am God, and you love me the most." Prove it. Yeah. I'm like, boy, you need to grow your kid. That's Abraham, right. yeah. Abraham. So, Abraham and Isaac, yeah. And he said, I I will prove to you that you are my God and the greatest. Right. And he right. went as far as to the last moments. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And we, 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 first, you know, um, it's a story. Mm -hmm. right. No, and it's a whole, it's, well, like I said, I've always. Oh, like, it's very problematic. Yeah. yeah like there's a, there's a great deal of cultural context we need to take into into account when we read the book sorry my dog's going crazy but anyway but, but that's that's an important thing when you read the bible if you take a flat approach a literal approach then you end up with a lot of these a lot of these uh uh problems with uh the, you know, the binding of isaac and things like that and what was really going on or or was you know that there are demon possession and things like that and what they were really talking about but these this was happening in a particular cultural context they were addressing primarily first the contemporary culture and then we have to take a look at what we understand now due to increased understanding you know science and mental health and things like that we have to extrapolate out from that and try to and try to get contemporary interpretations and how that applies to us mm -hmm. because yeah that's that those are serious issues to address and we have to think 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 about those things because like, like you say i the binding of isaac bo bothered me tremendously i think that's one of the most difficult stories for me to rationalize that a god who later said that child sacrifice was absolutely abhorrent to him and that he was condemning the nations around him for for that practice and yet according to that account he asked abraham to go to that point why would he even suggest such a thing you know that's a that's a real difficult thing to 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 yeah. understand and if you do believe god wrote the bible then you're waiting for the second edition where that god does a rewrite and says maybe that wasn't the best story <laughs> not the best example to use right I, I saw a really good book that, that addresses some of these issues. It's uh, I can give you the exact name if anybody's really interested. But anyway, it's written by a guy named Cortman. And basically, the, the thesis of the book is saying no to God. Mm. And oh. the is, is that understanding God's character. Sometimes God seems to be telling us things that are in complete contradiction to God's character. And what God, in testing Abraham's faith, maybe he wasn't so much seeing if he would do it, so much as looking to see if Abraham would, in a sense, say no to God and say, okay, I'm taking you up on your bat. I don't believe you're going to, you know, you're going to push me. I know you better than that, God. I don't believe that you're actually going to ask me to. So anyway, it takes through several, several yeah. Th yeah. things that happen in in the bible that are similar to this things that just are virtually inexplicable but maybe it means that if we really understand what god is like maybe the test of faith is to say even if god seems to be saying that i know he's not because i know god is not that way yeah and you could also then add maybe god is is in my response actually yeah i'll say no oh. you know my act of defiance yeah um it's they are definitely popular. I mean, look, we went through a similar thing this and these, these last few days in Holy Week. I mean, there's it's hard to escape that Good Friday has this kind of tinge of that Abraham Isaac thing of just how can a God, you know, let his son suffer in this way and and hear the cry of my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet at the same time, I. I can imagine there's a lot of parents who have punished their children who might resonate with some aspect of that, <laughs> you know, where you, you're, you're filled with such love and yet you're watching your child endure some kind of um, suffering is really difficult. You know, punishment wasn't the right word, but consequences. Wow. Consequences. I've heard Brian, I just, just in response to what you say, I, one of my, one of the authors I've consulted in regard to violence and things like that, a guy by the name of Brian Zahn, he says a God that would do that would be a monster God. Yeah. And I think that, I think that in terms of the atonement, I've had to come to the point where I say that I don't think God killed Jesus or forced him to Jesus. I think there's other ways of looking at that. I believe Jesus was killed because he represented another kind of kingdom a kingdom that was in direct opposition to the world, a kingdom with a complete different, the functions with using completely different tactics instead of power over and money and 
violence, it's service and self-love. But yes, those things are there in a lot of people. But the, 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 where this becomes dangerous, though, I think, is that when people believe these things about God, mm-hmm. it shapes the way they believe and it shapes the way they believe they should live. Right, exactly. Right. When it's much more fluid. Right. Um, we should probably leave it there. I wanted to say one little thing while we leave as we leave chapter three. A good a good back to the synoptic thing. A good example of theological shifts mm-hmm. made by Matthew and Luke when they when they interpret Mark. In Mark's account of the baptism, which is how the book begins mm-hmm. in the Gospel of Mark. Um, Mark chapter one, the heavenly voice is also there at the baptism and says to Jesus, so that only Jesus can hear it, you are my beloved son. So then Matthew's reading that, and for whatever reason, we're you know, we don't know. Matthew said, It's not working for me. And actually, I think I think other people would have heard it. So he changes it to say, God pronouncing, This is my son, whom I dearly love my beloved my fine you know and that's not a negative because it still rings true for the god we've experienced in scripture already that god will speak like that but you see how the kind of story matthew was telling is a much more personal story of a of a we call it a suffering servant you know really a story of just a dialogue between jesus and god whereas matthew's voice has a god that's pronouncing this for all to hear you know just cool little stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's, it's oh, very characteristic. I'm just going to say real quickly that's very characteristic of Mark because Mark has yep. the hidden Messiah all throughout. Right. He, it, exactly. Mark, Jesus never really is proclaimed as that. He he not only he tells his disciples not to say the, about tell people about the things that, and the, his miracles. Don't tell anybody this whole right. secret Messiah thing. Yeah. Exactly. Now Matthew is pushing pedal to the metal of this is the fulfillment of scripture this is the son of god here we go everybody (laughs) yep all right thank you everybody and we'll pick it up in chapter four next week (laughs) (laughs) oh we get an applause